I've always appreciated media that has the power to transport you somewhere you've never been before, fully realizing details so minuscule that it stays with you long after putting the thing down. That kind of strong world building that's native to something written like books or manga. Animation might be more recognizable, but you're still pulled into the world by visual and environmental details. And of course, movies can do a decent job of this as well. It all knew how much. But oh man, video games do this better than any other medium. I bet each and every one of you watching right now has about a half a dozen games that you know can always transport you to another world where incredible things are always possible, the worlds are almost unbelievable, and the bonds we make with characters live on in our heads forever. So would you believe me if I said that earlier this year I discovered something unlike any other anything before? In March, I took a trip through Clash Artifacts of Chaos. It's a pretty good action RPG with some cool martial arts combat that we'll talk more about later on. But the most interesting thing about it was its world. The land of Xenozoic absolutely captivated me. It was all just beyond intriguing, and it achieves this in a couple of ways, but mainly being odd and unpredictable. I closed that video out with some questions to longtime fans of the series on that cliffhanger of an ending, asking if it did make any more sense to those who have actually played the previous Xenoclash games. And the answers fell somewhere in between yes and no, which honestly just made me want to see the story for myself even more. And I kinda feel like the studio planned on this because they went and slashed the already low prices of the first two Xenoclash games on Steam. Yeah, baby, I'd love to save money. I bit the bullet and went ahead and picked them up for the video I knew I was eventually going to make, but now that I have the time to dedicate to these games, I can't wait to tell you all about my beautifully bizarre adventure through Xenozoic. Ace Team, the Chilean studio responsible for this franchise, was originally made up of three brothers, Andreas, Carlos, and Edmundo Berdo. These guys got their interest in gaming through using programs on the family computer to crack open games they like to dig through the files, taking a peek at things like animations to see how they work under the hood. And as they got older, this fascination with software never really went away, leading them to create mods of their favorite games like Doom 2 and Quake 3 Arena. But eventually the brothers would set out to become more official. The first iteration of what would become Ace Team would take form after hiring programmer Juan Pablo Lastra beginning development of Xenozoic Shattered Land in 2002. However, the boys would quickly realize that they had bitten off way more than they could chew with this first project. By 2003, the project was completely shut down with Carlos and Andreas being scooped up by a local studio, Wanako Games. Around four years later in 2007, after feeling a little less fulfilled by Wanako's output of casual, friendly titles, Carlos and Andreas left the company to give Ace Team another shot. Xenozoic Shattered Land began on the LithTech Jupiter engine that powered several first and third person shooting games like Medal of Honor Pacific Assault and Tron 2.0, a game that I own for some reason. But then after restarting Ace, the decision was made to move development to id Tech 4, which powered games like Doom 3 along with Prey 1 and 2, only for it to then move, for the last time, to the Source engine, Valve's proprietary technology that birthed Half-Life 2 and the Left 4 Dead games, among others. And I didn't officially find this out until after I beat the game, but I had a strong feeling this was the case. The menus were left completely unchanged, so it's like I was looking at the Half-Life 2 options, and the water in the game is unchanged as well. No new shaders or anything were used from what I can tell. These don't really mean anything, I just think it's cool to recognize this stuff. At this point, the original Xenozoic Shattered Land prototype was completely scrapped, with the new project being more of a spiritual successor, fittingly getting a new name at the recommendation of Valve, Xeno Clash. I'm not sure what the specifics of the conversation between Ace and Valve were like, but I'm glad it happened. Xenozoic as a title didn't really give you a lot of information. Was, was it a card game? Was it a strategy game? We have no idea. With Xeno Clash, you get the feeling that there's going to be some kind of juicy conflict, you know? 
But after all that languishing, Xenoclash was released for PC on April 21st of 2009 with an enhanced Ultimate Edition coming on May 5th of 2010. It doesn't add anything but new gameplay elements like new weapons and a multiplayer component for the arena mode. No selling points if you ask me. Which is why I'm sticking to the PC release for all three games we're covering today. But I think it's time we start talking about what actually happens in the crazy f***ing land of Xenoclash. This is Gat. We caught Gat at a really bad time. He just committed a murder. And he didn't kill anyone. He killed his father and mother, or it might be more accurate to say that he killed Father Mother, a hermaphrodite that births and raises many children in the city of Halstom. Father Mother raises these children to be a part of their clan, and together they're one of the most feared clans within the city walls. But that has all come to an end thanks to Gat. As he's being chased out of the city by more Father Mother's children, he's helped by Deidre, a companion that Gat has assumedly met already because she asks him to distract the assailants while she opens up the city gate. The two make it out of the city and find their way into the forest. Here they run into another clan, the Corwid of the Free. These individuals, as Gat puts it, aren't slaves to reality like everyone else. They don't feel the need to drink water or eat food. They do whatever it is they want to do at that moment and that's it. This guy wants to eat people, so that's what he does. This this guy wants to headbutt stuff, so that's what he does. This guy feels like he needs to walk in a straight line, so he does it until it literally kills him. One of them was Erminia. Erminia peed on herself and starved to death anonymously. And that is what Armenia did. Corwids are a big reason as to why Xenozoic is so unique. They make for a really interesting faction to have around. It's at this point that the game decides to tell its story in a non-linear fashion, constantly pausing the present day narrative to let Gat enlighten Deidre on what his life was like leading up to him killing Father Mother. It does make for a suspenseful means of storytelling, but I'll be streamlining it a bit for the sake of this summary. Gat takes us back in time to tell us the story of how he got into this mess in the first place. After showing interest in the outside, he left Father Mother's clan and became a Corwid for a while. Gat tells us of Metamok, a Corwid that trained our main man and taught him how to defend himself. But during their last training session, Metamok decided to pull a bomb out while Gat was pinned down and... And then he killed himself. That's a cack and weird story. If that is what the Corwid of the Free are like, I don't want to stay here. After this, Gat decided to head back to Halstom to try and sort things out with Father Mother. But after a conversation with them, it's clear that Father Mother has already kicked Gat out of the clan. And fearing that he knows their secret, they distance themselves from Gat and basically disown him. But Gat is quite confused on why Father Mother would react so harshly to him simply leaving and then wanting to return. Thus, he sets out again, determined to find Father Mother and hopefully learn the truth. He dips into the sewers to find a way around their bodyguards, eventually doing so and pleading with Father Mother to just tell their secret, having recently realized it himself. But they don't back down, forcing Gat to eventually pull the same trick that Metamog did, killing Father Mother. Back in the present day, Gat and Deidre, still running from Father Mother's children, find themselves in this ancient temple. After powering on these torches, an ancient being awakens. This is Golem. He surprises our duo by using their names and telling them all about themselves. We were going that way until we bumped into you. No, God. There isn't anything left there. Surprised I know your name. I know everything about you. Deandra, every step you take away from Halstom is to find something better. But every place you leave is worse than the last. For freeing him from this prison, Golem promises to guide them back to Halstom and help them fix the problems that they were facing. On the boat ride back to the city, Golem tells that he has lived to see the end of the world. He was placed into stasis, essentially, to be there when he was needed. But the people who put him there are long gone, yet he remains loyal to their ideals. As we'll see later on, Golem is by far the most interesting character in this entire series. To this day, we have no idea what his actual motivations or goals really are. And that's wild to me. To this day, I, I remind you, but we'll, let's continue on. Almost back to Halston, we stumble across this woman holding a pig in a swaddle. Pig? No, it's not a pig. Or at least not just a pig. This is my son, Gosni. Some months ago, I was surprised too, when I saw my little boy look like a pig. 
But after this, our band of misfits makes it to the town gates, with Golem effortlessly lifting it while Gat fights back his brothers and sisters. When suddenly, a banged and bruised father mother reappears and asks the group to follow them so they can end all of this. They command all of the children to stand back and let them punish Gat. After a grueling battle, they have Gat pinned down and are ready to smash his head when Golem breaks one of his own fingers, causing Father Mother, Deidre, and Gat to all have the same broken finger as well. This gives Gat a moment and he brings the hammer down on Father Mother. Gat says he doesn't want to kill Father Mother and even considers them his father and his mother still. To which the being reciprocates that through it all and they're grateful that Gat never told anyone the secret. But Golem isn't having any of this. Change needs to come to this land and he's going to be the one to do it. Things are going to change here. Father Mother is neither your father nor your mother. He is a male creature, incapable of giving birth to anyone or anything. He took each one of you away from your real fathers and mothers when you were babies. In time, I can prove this to each one of you and to show you your real family. Golem then monologues about how this land is a small part of something much larger, how there are places much bigger than Halstom and even Xenozoic itself. The game then closes out with a giant metal statue and a completed Rubik's Cube. This potentially being symbolic of Golem's journey being completed, seeing as how he was idly trying to solve a Rubik's Cube at other points in the story. Okay, so that's the first chapter of our story, and if you're still confused as to what's going on, you're not alone. But I hope my analogy from earlier makes a bit more sense. This world, Xenozoic, has such a way of drawing you in with these mysteries. In some ways, I'm scared that they might never truly pay off and we'll have a Kingdom Hearts type situation on our hands, where these questions will continue to pile up and we're sitting on a mound of them only to eventually receive some less than interesting answers. But at the moment, I'm f***ing spellbound. Gat as a protagonist is decent. I could do without his tattooed on mustache and sideburns, but other than that, his appearance conveys the well-meaning crazy guy. I think it's a little silly that things get so bad between him and Father Mother just because he wanted to live somewhere else for a bit, but Golem even says that they both acted irrationally, so the game is aware of this. The only real hang-up I have concerning Gat is how he learned of Father Mother's secret. He goes into Halstom not knowing, meets up with Father Mother outside the bar, and then by the time he goes into the sewer and then confronts him, he just realizes the secret? I might be missing something, but that seems a little convenient. Deidre is a little on the weak side for me. I get that she probably came from an awful life and her running away with Gat is supposed to be her solution, but we never see or hear anything about that supposed life. She only tells us that anything is better than where she was, so maybe she is just along for the ride. The twist of Father Mother's reveal as a straight up baby thief was very interesting and it did catch me off guard for the most part. The pig lady had my mind going, but it's not exactly what I expected. Golem though, talk about an enigma. I know I keep repeating myself, but it can't be understated how interesting this guy is. Why does his physical condition mirror Gat and Deidre's as well? We see this twice and it's never really explained. We know he's gotta be some kind of god, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. The way these characters are portrayed contributes to the feel of the world as well. When the game was released, it caused some flack for the voice performances not being of the best quality, and while that's definitely true, a lot of the deliveries are pretty wonky and lack a lot of finesse that professional actors would have, this can be helped in a lot of cases as some of the development team stepped into voice characters. Edmundo is actually the voice of Father Mother and Golem. I would argue, though, that the sporadic poor voice acting adds to the mystique of Xenozoic. It might be giving a less than stellar aspect of the production more credit than it's due, but I think hearing these odd characters talk in broken, stilted English makes them feel more alien. Like, it adds a layer of grime to Xenozoic, hearing these weirdos talk like this as opposed to hearing them speak with an Australian accent or something more official. And in the same vein, they chose to replace certain swear words from our vernacular with some made-up ones. Like, instead of calling someone a d**k, you'd say teff, Or instead of s**t, you'd say cack. 
I'm usually not crazy about made up words like this, but I think it works for Xenozoic. The team chose to go with the Source engine for a number of reasons, but one of the most important was the impressive in-game facial animations it was capable of. Since it's a first person game and these weird characters are going to be conversing right in front of you, they wanted to have movements as fluid as possible, and I think they succeeded. Even these otherworldly abominations have such detail in the way their faces move. It's something you'll continue to see as we travel throughout these games, no matter how complicated these 3D character models get, they're always animated really well, which is very admirable. Sure, the technology is dated by today's standards, but one thing you can't take away from Xenoclash is the believable way these people's faces move when they talk. I couldn't help but notice though, for as captivating as the story is, the way it was fed to us felt odd in some areas. At some points in the story, Deidre asks Gat why he won't just level with her and explain everything to her all at once. Why did Father Mother get so upset? I figured it out later, but I can't tell you why. But that's the whole point of telling me the story. I just won't tell you. You are telling me in part, Lisa! Again, I can look past and even appreciate the delivery in a funny way, but chopping up the story like this is a little harder to excuse. It's obviously to help pace the story to their liking, and it does make sense that Gab would want to keep Father Mother's secret for as long as he could, but this artificial pacing lacks the kind of grace a non-linear story like this needs to feel natural. I think the game could have benefited from less cuts back to the past. Bundle a few of the flashbacks up so we play them back to back and get a more or complete vision of Gat's past instead of 10 minutes of elaboration after 10 minutes of progress in the present. Even still though, I'm beyond hooked and can't wait to see the next chapter of this story. But first, this is a video game and we gotta talk about what you do in this game. Xenoclash is a first-person martial arts adventure game. Gat and Deidre will travel from linear level to linear level, fighting bad guys, doing very little exploration, and solving somewhat of a puzzle in one level. This is a very short game by today's standards, but hey, I won't fault a game for being too short if it's at least fun, but it is something to mention here. Levels usually only last 15 or 20 minutes, if that. There are sometimes things to find like extra health berries or items to use in combat, but any other type of exploration is either discouraged by damaging barriers or just not allowed by way of the level's construction. This doesn't really bother me though, the game does a good enough job of showing you the world through everything else. The environments, the cutscenes, I don't think the linear nature of Xenoclash is a negative, especially when you're constantly thrown into combat. Being mentored by Metamok, Gat is a pretty capable fighter. He has a light three hit combo on left click. By looking down, he can do this little eh, kick. It's good for swatting away smaller enemies or attacking enemies on the ground. He can perform a heavy attack with right click. This can get even stronger if it's activated when walking backwards. If an enemy is stunned, he can get them in a hold and pummel them a few times before choosing a direction and throwing them. Holding shift will allow for a sprint and then from that a running elbow attack. Gat can block incoming attacks by holding space, but blocking right as an attack lands will deflect the blow, leaving them open for a counter kick. Bombs can be found in some levels and will detonate a short time after being thrown. They can roll deceptively far though, so be careful not to waste them. There are weapons you can find laying around, but they all have the same moveset. A lumbering swing on left click and a chargeable swing on right click. I found that the left click swing is just too slow to be reliable. So if you just spam the right click, the swings will come out a lot faster and have decent range on top of it. There is an exclusive melee weapon in one level that throws fireballs at these weird things, but that's the only time you get to use it so it's not important. Then there are firearms. It was interesting to see guns in this game, not gonna lie. I knew it was melee focus, so seeing these things made me question the balance of it all. There are dual pistols which fire fairly rapid shots, a rifle that can load three long range shots for decent damage, a crossbow that that loads two small heads. I guess. They do decent damage as well. Then finally, there's the grenade launcher. It doesn't show up very often, but that's for a good reason. This thing ragdolls enemies immediately and does crazy damage. Most of the guns don't do a whole lot of damage to the enemies, but they're still broken because they all have infinite ammo. Yeah, every one of them can be forever reloaded, but the main reason they don't tip the balance too badly is because of the enemies themselves. If they see you holding a firearm, they'll make a beeline for you to knock it out of your hands. It's pretty realistic how battles become struggles over these guns when they're on the field. Speaking of enemies though, they can block attacks, but using a heavy attack will break their guard, leaving them open to a follow-up attack. A lot of them do 
use the same attack, so the variety isn't a selling point, but a few have their own unique moves. The interesting ways they behave in battle does kind of make up for it. They can run away and block when they need to, some can even duck under certain attacks. There are a few small enemies like bugs or crabs that are just meant to be annoyances, so they go down pretty easily. But then we come to the large enemies. These guys will charge at Gat and can't be seriously hurt by anything but weapons. This is where spamming the charge attack works wonders. They're left in hit stun for so long that they can't do anything, and then when they're dazed, you get to crack them on the head, which is very satisfying. <laughs> There is one gimmick boss fight that you fight twice where you have to use a rifle to shoot at him while he throws squirrels with explosives strapped to them at you. It's visually funny, but it's pretty easy to stunlock him as well. Father Mother's fight is pretty interesting. You have to race to grab the guns on the battlefield and then shoot their legs enough for them to fall. It's not much, but it is cool. I hope enemies have more interactivity with specific body parts later on. While the basic combat isn't anything to write home about, I think it's decent. There's no real combo game, but reading and reacting to the enemy's moves can be engaging. Deflecting attacks and countering is very rewarding to do, and running at someone and f***ing decking them with a heavy swing never gets old. I think Ace did a really admirable job on the flow and feel of combat, and even if it took them a few scrapped projects to get here, it's really something for their first commercial release as a team. <laughs> Of course, it's not perfect, and I do have issues with combat as a whole. Firstly, and I knew I was going to have this problem going into this game, it's a first-person game focusing on melee combat. I've gone over my feelings towards this perspective and melee stuff before on this channel, so very briefly, I don't think it ever works. My go-to example will always be Bright Memory Infinite. No matter how hard you try with this perspective, you will always, always have camera issues. Enemies that will attack you from off-screen. Yep becoming disoriented easily. Check. Having to run away from a fight just to turn around to get a better look at the fight? So many times. And having trouble connecting with hits because depth perception can be fickle. And look, I get that disorientation is part of the immersion. The devs have even admitted that this is a lesson they had to learn, that disorientation is a big part of other first-person games and it brings an immersive quality when playing in the perspective. And I would agree with them to a certain degree. Getting run over by a huge monster and having the camera take a tumble too is pretty immersive. I felt that happen. But where I draw the line is it obscuring information I need for a fight. In a game focused on martial arts, I need to know where my attackers are coming from at all times so I know how to react to the danger at a moment's notice. Fighting more than one enemy in this game is a nightmare. Unless you can stun an enemy and throw them into another to incapacitate them for a short time, any kind of uneven number battle is wonky as hell. There is a feature that allows you to lock onto an enemy to focus on them, but the way that you swap lock on and break lock on are the same input. So if you want to break lock on so you can run away to reposition or something, you'll just shift lock on to another target if one is around. And holy sh if you're trying to quickly pick up a weapon on the ground in front of an enemy, it turns into one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had to go through. Because the interact button also shares the same input as the lock on. I was horrified to discover that when I looked at the options. I pray that changes to fix big problems like this will be implemented in the next game. I would also love to see more crowd control moves to help mitigate the dogpiling that occurs in fights. And really quickly, the soundtrack composed by Patricio Menezes. I'm not the biggest fan if I'm being honest. The whole thing has this problem of every track sounding too similar. They all have this big bombastic quality to them. Lots of big drums and cellos or tubas. Feel free to correct me, I wasn't a band nerd. And it's not that I dislike songs that sound larger than life, but when every track has that quality, it's hard to differentiate one from another. When a town theme sounds like this, A forest theme sounds like this. And the end of the world sounds like this. tracks start to bleed together. My two standouts are The Bounty Hunter because of its quick pace, and Danger in the Mist for the strange ethereal vibes it gives, until about halfway through when it brings back the large drums and drowns out the ambiance. But overall, I couldn't hum you a single tune from the soundtrack. I'm hoping to see more diversity in the music Patricio makes next time, seeing as how his company is responsible for all of the Xenoclash games. 
All in all, I was happy with what I played. The game itself was decent with some issues that beg for revision, but overall it was a good time. Punching these weird creatures in the face proved to be consistently enjoyable, so much so that I put some time into the challenge ladder. It's just a gauntlet of predetermined enemy encounters, but it was fun. A lot of people might see this game as nothing but you having to beat up Sloth from the Goonies. You're gonna live with me now. And, you know, they probably wouldn't be entirely wrong, but it is more than just that. The real reason I kept playing was to see the engaging story of Gat, Deidre, and Golem unfold. I need to know where this all goes from here, and I think it's time we found out. After Xenoclash was released to fairly positive reviews, the team got to work on a sequel, and for as many interviews that exist for the original Xenoclash, there are next to no behind the scenes or dev diaries on the sequel. The team just made the game and released it on April 30th of 2013 as far as I know. Fun fact though, the first game's original digital release was self-published, with an Xbox 360 release being published by Atlas. Atlas would also take on Xenoclash 2's publishing duties from start to finish. Atlas's parent company is Sega. All I'm trying to say is we better see Gat as a racer in the next Sonic and Sega All-Stars game. <laughs> Could you even imagine? Sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, so try not to act surprised, but we've once again switched engines. Source may have brought life to Xenozoic originally, but now we've moved on to the Unreal Engine. Unreal 3 to be exact, but again, that's all I know as far as development goes. I hope this doesn't spell bad news for us, but no point in wondering, let's find out now. Uh, the game's tutorial also acts as a prologue to the story by the way, so we'll be starting there. In a dreamlike void, Gat begins sparring with his memory of Metamock. After the confrontation with Father Mother and after Golem revealed him to be a baby snatcher, many of Father Mother's children left to reunite with their true birth parents. Very few stayed behind to uphold Father Mother's clan. Golem has since attempted to introduce laws into Halstom, creating a jail for criminals and placing Father Mother in there first thing. Golem has also revealed his ability to link himself to anyone he touches, causing any pain inflicted onto him to mirror onto anyone who has had physical contact with the man. Golem is a mystery to Gat, not knowing what he wants or why he's trying to bring order to Halstom. All Gat knows is that he doesn't like it. But in the story proper now, Gat is approached by Remat outside the hideout. This woman was just a rival type character in the first game, showing up to fight the original trio on occasion to bring them back to Halstom. She's still extremely loyal to Father Mother and hates that he's been locked up in jail. Remat wants to stage a jailbreak, but the only person she can trust to help her is Gat. You're the only real brother I have left. You mean you asked Golem about your real family and... No. Anyone who puts father mother in a cage doesn't know Tef about my real family. You're my only real brother because out of all, you're the only one who didn't ask Golem either. So the two make a beeline for Golem's prison to break father mother out. Gat and Remat make their way to the top of the prison where Golem is speaking with an unknown figure, telling them how primitive these creatures actually are. Even though the Xenozoikians have been here for hundreds of years, they've developed no type of laws or leadership. We then learn that Golem's true name is Kaxte, and this being reminds him that it's not his job to take an interest. He could try to introduce some kind of currency or other system, but the majority wouldn't understand the concept. You could also have them all killed, and hope something more worthwhile spawns. No. You had to say that. I just wanted to count how many seconds it would take you to respond. You must really dislike this generation. Our duo then scurry on and locate Father Mother, busting him out of his cell, or at least they watch him bust out on his own. <laughs> Okay. Just then, Kaxte enters the room and reminds them that he only helped to raise the prison. Other Xenozoikians have taken it upon themselves to enforce the laws that he implemented, meaning that whoever is in here is incarcerated for a reason. Father Mother, not really interested in the ethics lessons, takes Gat and Remet and jumps out of the window. They try to escape to the old hideout, but Kaxte is already waiting for them there. Gat asks why Father Mother should be locked up in jail. He hasn't stolen any children from them. Kaxte tries to explain that the jail's purpose is to separate separate criminals from the citizens. But Gat interrupts by saying if anyone has a problem with them, they can come fight. I have a problem with you. Yeah, them. I have a problem with you. We'll get into it later, but Gat is kind of annoying in this game. But after the scuffle gets out of hand, Father Mother helps Gat and Remat escape for the time being. After the two make it out of the city, Remat devises a plan. In order to help Father Mother, they need to recruit as many of his children as they can. This is off to a good start when they meet up with Pot, who thankfully found Father Mother in the sewer. Gat is hesitant about 
about this plan, worried that they won't help fight Caxte when the time comes because of his power. He has his heart set on traveling back to the golem's land and finding a way to neutralize his power. Killing the golem would mean finding a way to get rid of his laws, which is all Gat wants right now. No one is exactly down with this idea though, not even father mother, instead assuring Gat that their family is strong enough to face anything together. Even still, he finds it necessary to tell the story of how he once sailed across the sea and found another golem temple, implying that something there could probably help defeat Caxte. So what do you think Gat immediately does? The two set out for the edge of the island to find a boat, but not before being trapped by another golem. He reveals that he's interested in their plight and wants to help, giving them this gauntlet as a gift and sending them on their way. The two eventually make it to this island and find a faceless golem with a bird in its head. It attacks the two, but they take it down and receive a golem weapon that's capable of linking two beings together, very similar to Caxte's power. They then get the idea to head north to Caxte's temple, still hoping to find something to kill him with. After breaching his temple and finding a hidden passage underground, Gat and Remat find themselves on the outskirts of what looks to be a modern city, only to be surprised by the purple dude himself. I cannot allow you to go there. The world is larger than Xenozoic, much larger. But since you are not allowed to leave the confines of your land, I decided you should remain unaware of the golem explains that civilization, this civilization, has kept Xenozoic isolated for a reason. The world is much, much larger than just Xenozoic. And the outside has kept Xenozoic away because they are so uncivilized. Sick of hearing about all this nonsense, Gat strikes Caxte and surprisingly, he doesn't feel the blow himself. His link has been severed. The two take advantage of the situation to incapacitate the golem, nearly landing the killing blow before the link spontaneously decides to return. An exhausted Gat starts heading for the city to see it for himself, but Caxte warns against it. I cannot allow you to go to the city. Uh, you can barely walk. But we are linked. If you go north, I will crush my organs and you will die. You bastard! You can't do that! The golem is steadily dying thanks to Gat and Remat. The two ask if the other golems could help, but the only golem who is Caxte's equal is the South Golem, and the two often disagree. In order to save themselves, as well as everyone who's been touched by Caxte from dying along with the golem, the two need to venture to the East Golem's pink tower and recover parts that will save his life. To do this, Caxte instructs them to head deep into the Corwood Forest and find this being with two heads. This little monkey is from the Pink Tower and knows how to open the gate that blocks the path to the east. After a lengthy climb up the mountains and watching the monkey die, the siblings arrive on top of the tower only to discover that the east golem is dead and has been this way for some time. Just when all hope is lost, the south golem, or Zotolte, appears aboard his flying vessel and reveals himself to be the same entity that was speaking with Caxte in the jail, as well as the person who provided Gat and Remat with the gauntlets in the desert. So why did he show up here and now? Well, he brings with him a pretty decent exposition dump. The reason these golems keep dying is simply because they're too bored. They live so long and have so little to do that they eventually just start to waste away. This is more than likely why each of them have been seen with some sort of game near their throne. Caxte was always seen with a Rubik's Cube in the previous game, the West Golem had a board of Chinese checkers next to him before he died, and the East Golem can be seen with a full chessboard. That wasn't enough for the East Golem though, he took to breeding chimera monkeys with two heads, beings who are smarter, faster, and better in every way. But Caxte apparently didn't like this and according to Zotolte, basically got a permit to kill the East Golem before the Chimeras could be perfected. All Coxte wants from the Watute are some parts. I can take them to him for you. We're not touching you. I don't want to be linked to the North Golem and to you. Don't worry, I don't have the linking power. Our makers made us choose a limited number of powers, and isn't it more beautiful to make things fly? So with Zotolte on route to save Caxte, Gat and Remat think it's best to return to Halstom and find Father Mother. They do so only to find Zotolte again, but with a tied up Father Mother. 
He took it upon himself to round up the parents of the children that Father Mother has stolen, and they rightfully want revenge. Zodolte finds it acceptable to facilitate this. With Caxte out of the picture for now, he's going to change Xenozoic, but he's going to do it his way. Gat and Remat spring into action, stopping the murder of Father Mother, but Zodolte seems to be unfazed by this turn of events. He instead encourages Gat to meet him in the high city for his true test. And wouldn't you know, on top of the city, Caxte and Zadolte wait for Gat and Remat. The South Golem explains that he has been giving people tests. I'm not sure what they're for or what data he's gathering by doing them, but what is clear is that his test for Caxte here was to essentially put him against a rock and a hard place. He knew that Caxte wouldn't dare break the laws their creators laid out for them, but his strong moral compass wouldn't bring him to kill. Thus, giving Gat and Remat the tools to not only pass the North Temple's borders, but also have a fair fight with their begrudged lawmaker. So he disabled Caxte's link and let them have at it. He also explains that the golems were created as protectors of the borders, and if someone has crossed a border, the corresponding golem is supposed to kill the trespasser. But again, he knows Caxte wouldn't kill. Zorote also noted how Gat refused to kill Caxte. Not because he didn't want to, but because if he did, he'd also be killing everyone that Golem was linked to. Thus, we have Gat's test. Allow me to get rid of that obstacle for you. Gat, now the Golem is still linked to you, but no one else is. What will you do? With a moral compass off of his back, Gat attacks both Golems with the intent to kill. But at the end of the fight, it's not Gat or Remat that ends things. Instead, Caxte realizes he's not going to win this in his current state. So instead of letting Zodolte continue his mind games, he sacrifices himself to take them both out. With all four golems gone, their creators will send replacements. Replacements that will hopefully do a better job of guarding Xenozoic. After all is said and done, we see Remat returning to Father Mother and Gat returning to Deidre, presumably to live out the rest of their lives. Okay, there's a lot to unpack after that. Let's start with the characters again. Gat does a bit of a flip compared to the first game. There, he was excited to bring the golem back to Halstom. And Caxte even saved Gat's head from becoming a pancake. Yeah, he ended up telling Father Mother's secret and doing damage to their clan, but Gat's straight up hatred for the North Golem seems like it comes out of nowhere. I get that the new laws aren't great and they probably flush Father Mother's operation down the drain, but Gat didn't seem to care all that much about Father Mother in this game. You don't sound too concerned. I don't care about that crowd. The Golem is what worries me. He only cares about the clan so he can use it against Kagste. As the story moves along, I can see how all the lies stack up and make him more confused and angry at the golems, the supposed protectors of this land, but it still feels like an unearned jump in logic. Gat has been shown to be an anarchist, downright hating rules and laws. This is part of why he went to live with the Corwid. He even questions if he is still a Corwid. Am I a Corwid? But Gat is also the central protagonist, and when his reasoning sounds so haphazard, the journey with him becomes harder to stomach. I didn't like Gat in this game, and most of it's because of his shitty attitude towards a character that, again, rocked the foundation, but is also trying to make things better. This is brought up once, where Remat asked Gat what happened to Deidre, with him saying that when Kagste took over, his attitude started to change and she didn't want to be around it. So canonically, I guess he did just up and become a jerk who only cares about stopping the golem because he put some laws into effect. But again, at points in the story, it feels like an abrupt, antagonistic stance for his character. Remat wasn't really anything in the last game, merely a rival at points and a pretty inconsequential one at that. She also looks and acts like a cross between Azula and Yang Xiaolong because she's sort of a sassy bitch. But unlike that, I didn't make such a fuss about it. But here, she's a bona fide player too, along for the entire ride. But she doesn't do a whole lot for the story. It's not that she really detracts from anything, but she's just there. In the first part of the game, she's hell-bent on saving Father Mother and making sure he's okay, right? And she's had her fair share of punishment already. Um, why does Remat call Father Mother a she? It happens in the beginning of the game right there, and also towards the end. She's safe now. Everyone else confirms that he's still a he, so it didn't get retconned. Maybe it was a stylistic choice? Who knows? But anyway, she's so focused on rescuing Father Mother and getting the family back together that she's not really good at adding anything new to the conversation, mostly acting as someone for Gat to bounce off of and help maybe convey information to the player. Anything else? Let me ask you a very fair question. What do you do successfully? 
quickly. If father mother isn't the topic of discussion, she's not going to have any riveting commentary. It's a shame that Deidre was demoted to even more of a side character in this game. I thought Gad, Deidre, and Golem had a good dynamic, and I was looking forward to seeing it continue. But instead, Deidre is still the caring individual that did end up finding a home, which is nice for her character, but not great for the dynamic of the main party. Gat and Remat just aren't a lot of fun to travel with. If it isn't Gat and his massive hate boner for everything Golem related, then it's Remat and her obsession with everything father mother and nothing else. It's interesting to see Father Mother get some sort of redemption. I get the feeling that he really does care for his children, which is weird but sweet, I guess. But I feel like the Golem's plot was much more interesting. Caxte is a character that I feel I have a much better understanding of after this game. He was created by these unknown people who are still around despite what the original game may have told you. And the people who put you there, are they still around? No, they are dead now. Oops. But he doesn't have much, if any, contact with them, making him question the things that he's doing, if they're right, if it's worth it, should he keep going, is there a better way? Why do anything if these savages aren't grateful? And his moral compass is so heightened that it pushes him to do some really ridiculous things. He saw that the East Golden was creating abominations out of pure boredom, so he went to the extreme and murdered him. Now, I feel he knows this wasn't right, even if he did go through the legal channels to make the murder possible, but he understands that and puts his creator's laws above all else. We don't know what these laws are verbatim, unfortunately, but we do know two of them were to bring order to Xenozoic and protect his designated border. He's putting in extra credit to introduce laws into Halstom. The conversation with Zotelte at the beginning of the game makes this clear. He didn't have to take an interest in the Xenozoicians. And even still, Caxte never really believed these laws would work because of how, well, stupid these people are. He tells Gat and Remat straight up that he doesn't have faith in Xenozoic's ability to clean itself up, being able to be considered for return to the outside world. Zotelte, in an effort to not succumb to the fate of the other golems, Boredom, sets off to find a new purpose. His other equal, Caxte, is currently failing in his attempt to bring order to their shared land, so he wants to give it a shot. I can't be sure on this, but instead of a Rubik's Cube or Chinese checkers, I took Zotelte's game to be distributing tests. He likes to give and make up tests for people to either pass or fail. Stopping Gat and Remat at the end of the world was Caxte's test, and in Zotelte's eyes, he failed. Gat's test was to destroy Caxte at the end of the game, so I have to assume that they were only for Zotelte's enjoyment. Similar to Caxte's laws in the East Golem's Chimera experiments. And the reason none of this is exactly concrete is because, again, a lot of this is left up to interpretation. There's just enough here for you to get the basic gist of what's going on, but there are still so many unknowns. We still know nothing about the outside world besides that they have street lamps, speedboats, and are advanced enough to create the golems and place them at the ends of their world. We also have to assume that there are more worlds besides Xenozoic that connect to the outside world. Or maybe there are other worlds that are connected, but Xenozoic is the only one who was shut off from the others. And I'm still confused as to why Gat isn't dead at the end of the game, because it was made very clear that Caxte and Gat were still linked. And Caxte was squished, but somehow Gat survived? Maybe he terminated the link right before he died, but that's my thing, it's not clear. I also get that it being unclear is kind of the story's thing. But this is exactly the kind of stuff that makes me think the writers themselves don't know where the story is going either. We went from Gat accidentally discovering THE Golem in the first game to him now knowing all about the Golems and how there's four of them? That seems a little retconny to me. And I would have loved to know more about them, but instead, the story meanders us around to get to the Golem's locations. Being drug around to several places in the early game to complete what amounted to arbitrary filler just to get to the actual interesting stuff made the the adventure feel bloated. Which is a shame too, because the places we do get sent to aren't nearly as interesting as the locations we visited in the first game. I remember most of the interactions from the first game. The stuff involving the Corwids was great for world building, as well as the lawless feel of Halstom, and the mystique of who Golem actually was. Here in the sequel, we visit the Corwid forest, but we don't get as much time with the Corwids. Instead, we help out one of Father Mother's children with something unrelated. Halstom's side quests fare a bit better. I liked feeding this guy moths because it got us items for our adventure, I liked going and finding this dude who stole a guy's leg and then beat him up. I dig this stuff because it highlights that this city is still massively f***ed up and weird, a quality that got me interested in the series in the first place. 
but then the lowest of low is going to this canyon to find Deidre and this chick. It's nice that Gat and Deidre can reunite, but it feels unimportant when compared to the Golem stuff. I guess that also is a pretty subjective take. Some people might be more interested in the goings-on in Halstom and not care as much about the Golems. Some may think the Corwids were more than interesting here, and think the stuff regarding the civilization is boring and not fleshed out enough. That's totally possible and you shouldn't take my word as gospel in this wacky place. I just think the sequel loses some focus coming from the first game. A lot happened, some stuff that I haven't even mentioned, but I think the original game was more focused. It told a more concise story with some question marks at the end to make you think. This game also does that, but these question marks leave a confused look on my face instead of a fulfilled one. But now I'm sure you're curious. Since the story got so much attention, did the gameplay get just as much attention or did it stay stagnant coming from the sequel? Well, I can safely say that Xenoclash 2 is a much better game than Xenoclash 1. So Remap might not have had much to do in the story, but she's along for the entire adventure as a companion. This game has an ally system where you can recruit NPCs to fight alongside you in battles, and then when the fight is over, they'll smoke bomb away. I never ended up using this feature because you can also have the option to play the entire game in drop-in, drop-out co-op. So of course, I called Nick to join me in my second adventure across Xenozoic. As far as actual combat goes though, we've seen some decent changes. Each arm is now dedicated to a click on the mouse. To throw a left punch, you use left click. To throw a right punch, you use right click. A big thing this time around is chaining attacks into combos. If you just click the mouse, you will do a few rapid punches, typically four of them in a light combo. And if you hold down either input, you'll get your heavy attacks. You can still look down to bully enemies with your kicks, and sprinting around the battlefield and using a good elbow is still an entertaining way to catch these dudes by surprise. Enemies have been given some new UI elements to make the battlefield a little easier to read. A dazed enemy will have some white dots above their head, meaning they can be grappled. You can still pummel grabbed enemies as well as throwing them in a direction. But now a pummel can be followed by a multi-hit. Or you can finish a pummel with a very satisfying pile driver. You can also arm bar an enemy by deflecting attacks, but I don't think I knew exactly how to do this. Anytime I deflected an enemy, I could only do the counter kick, which is still really effective, so it's not a big complaint. Speaking of counter kicks, enemies approaching from behind are now far more manageable thanks to this slow-mo prompt that allows you to quickly turn around and get a kick in. And then my favorite addition are the exclamation points. So I wish I understood these better, but at some points during fights, there will be slow-mo breaks and an exclamation point will appear in a dotted circle. If you can move the cursor to the circle and attack with the correct fist, you'll get this juicy punch. The only thing is, I don't know how to activate this state. I don't know if I have to attack at the same time as the enemy or if I sometimes get it by deflecting. I'm not sure. I do think these battle notifications could stand to be a bit more distinguishable. Maybe make them solid red or yellow instead of transparent white would be my first thought. Even still, none of these maneuvers compare to the stuff you can do with the special meter. This will allow you to pull off special moves which can launch into juggles, which... <laughs> makes my heart very happy. There are several combinations that can get enemies in the air, and this is all thanks to the special meter. This allows you to do the really devastating combos, like the only one I ever consistently used, the hammer fist into heavy left, right, and a double fist charge. That might sound like a really tough input window to make with how enemies are launched into the air. Like, how can you land two charged attacks on an enemy that's coming down that fast? Well, the coolest part of the new special meter is that it seemingly allows you to use heavy attacks in instantly after you manage to launch an enemy, allowing you to land crazy damage on a ragdolling enemy while they're in the air. The left and right punch system feels fairly free-flowing, but there is a degree of stiffness to it. The tutorial doesn't do an amazing job of getting you to remember the combos it teaches. The way you refill your special meter is by pulling off certain combo attacks. Combos like left, right, left, heavy rider or something will put some juice in your meter. I never noticed the meter filling up after just using my basic light combos though. It has to be certain combinations of attacks to give you the chance to use the devastating stuff. And while I'm nitpicking, it could stand to be expanded further. While the combos might have slightly different effects, I would have liked for Gat's abilities to expand a bit more. I would have maybe liked some kicking combos or some unique unlockable attack animations that feel different than just punching by inputting certain combinations of left and right. It still doesn't quite reach the level of expressiveness a martial arts focused game should. And the attacks we do have aren't that distinguishable. A lot of them feel similar to each other, and the game never encourages you to use one side of your moveset over another. It's not bad by any means, and I would even say that I like this a great deal. The system could obviously stand to have a lot more work put into it to make it truly great, but it is the most fun I've had with combat in these two games.
But now we have these four artifacts that we can come across throughout the journey. The bombs are still here for us to find and they can be a great means of disrupting enemy clusters. By helping the guy who lost his foot, you're rewarded with a chain. No magical nonsense, just a straight up metal chain. This thing is actually a decent weapon to use and fills the need of the crowd control attack I so desperately wanted from the first game. Its reach is awesome and it stuns pretty much everything it hits. A cluster of enemies grouped up don't stand a chance. Just be sure your player two isn't in range as well. Next is the sun and moon gauntlet. This thing sucks. You aim this reticle at either the sun or the moon and when you let go, explosions run along the ground until it reaches where you were originally standing. It's not horrible as a puzzle solving tool, but for combat, it's just not useful. I mean, think about it. It's a projectile that comes from in front of you. You have to look potentially away from the thing you're fighting to activate it. And it travels as slow as shit. In the heat of combat, this thing is not helpful. Finally, there's the golem's hand. This thing can link two entities together, and when one takes damage, the other does as well. It doesn't last forever, but it is a cool ability to have. Linking two enemies and then having both players wail on them was a pretty decent strategy. And finally, there's the returning weapons. Melee weapons have returned, and there's no longer a slow swing on left click and a charge hit on right click. Both clicks can be charged to deal more damage. But now they can't be abused by just spamming the attack. They were given some much needed range, and I think overall they're more useful here in the sequel. Guns were given some extra balance as well. All firearms now have a very finite amount of ammunition that they can hold. Once you run out, the gun is worthless. They can still be used as a melee weapon if an enemy gets too close, but they can also break prematurely if used like that too often. Doing that is a disservice to them though. These things pack way more of a punch than they did previously. The pistols can't be dual wielded anymore, but their shots can do some great damage if you aim carefully. The rifle is back and is absurdly strong at any range, often causing enemies to fly backwards due to the force of the shots. God, who shoot me? Damn, boy, give me that Show you what it's God. like. Bitch. The crossbow doesn't make a return, but instead we have two new weapons. This spread gun thing will shoot bursts out, and it is a good option, but this triple barrel flaming shotgun absolutely obliterates anything that gets in its way. Guns are way better here, and it was a real treat to find them because we knew that they could actually be put to good use. The enemies haven't changed a whole lot from the previous game, but there have been some small improvements. They still swing with weird attack patterns, but they seem less aggressive towards the players that they aren't actively fighting. The added counter maneuvers I mentioned also help to take the pressure off, especially with moves like the surprise back kick. My favorite improvement has got to be for the big enemies though. In the previous game, the berserker enemies had to be taken down with a melee weapon. It slowed down fights really badly and made for encounters that were pretty stale since you couldn't take care of them through any other method. Here in this game, they can be damaged in any way. This made them way more manageable and even fun for a duo to take down. All of this is to say combat is much improved in this game and throwing down with a player two stayed as a highlight until the very end. Core screwdriver punch. Follow up. Uh, get your title back with Total Max. <laughs> We often worked hard to take enemies down in the beginning of fights, but would then reward ourselves by toying with the remaining few. It wasn't really feasible to coordinate and contribute to each other's combos, but when it accidentally happened, I always appreciated that the game allowed us to do that. Utilizing the artifacts and the advanced combat maneuvers made this a really enjoyable experience. I was worried that Nick wasn't going to be down with this game, seeing as how he had no experience with the first one, and I was kind of dropping him in in the deep end. He wasn't too into the story, which I totally get, but I was happy to see him eventually enjoying the game when it turned into Gremlin Punch Out. Severix Destroyer. Severix. Uterus Computus. Oh. <laughs> I did spend a very small amount of time with the extra modes in the game. There's the returning Colosseum mode where you'll fight increasingly difficult waves of enemies. Only this time you earn money for every kill to spend on things like health replenishing items, weapons you can bring into the next round. You can purchase the artifacts from the campaign if you save up, but I don't know why you'd ever buy the sun and moon gauntlet, that shit still sucks. And you can even buy allies to smoke bomb in and help you fight. This mode can be played with a friend, but Nick had already dipped by this point, so I just went solo for a bit before calling it quits. I then moved into this mode where you play the Colosseum, but you're a giant boulder. This is strange. 
You just roll around, and you can very easily kill the opponents by rolling over them. You still earn money, and you can even buy the allies again, but I often accidentally ran over them too, making them more roadkill than ally. This is a needless distraction, and the same can be said for the frame rate challenge. Going by the title, you'd think this was going to be a graphics benchmark, you know? To see how well your computer can run this game, but no, you spawn in and you get an FPS counter in the top corner, and then wireframe men start to spawn in like it's a multi-man melee and you use bombs to kill them, but they keep piling in by the truckload. This obviously causes your frame rate to slowly drop further and further. I think you keep going until your frame rate drops below 25? This is unneeded, but I won't lie and say this isn't a funny idea for an extra mode. You don't need to play any of these, but they are harmless. Outside of combat, the game's scope has increased dramatically. We're not playing a linear level-based game anymore. Xenoclash 2 is an open world with plenty of exploration and optional routes to explore. These areas you can explore are really impressive for the size of this team. I haven't mentioned it yet, but Xenoclash 2 was made by just 15 people, and for how wide open and visually unique these worlds are, I think that deserves praise. A few of the environments aren't as breathtaking as others, but a lot of them bring the wow factor. That first time you're let loose in the open Xenozoic field is a highlight. The trek up the mountain to the pink tower and laying eyes on that huge bridge that you actually get to walk across was special. The non-hostile wildlife you can come across are right at home in this world, drawing in my eyes every time. The visual variety was stunning throughout the playthrough. This is a small thing, but I think I prefer the Source Engine's water. It just looked more murky and grimy, especially the smaller puddles. Coming back to the same areas in the sequel makes me see how much more effort a team has to put in to render good looking water in Unreal, versus what I presume are the Source Engine's default shaders. Characters generally look pretty good. I think Remat's collarbone looks like it's trying to climb out of her body, but everyone looks decent for the most part. It's pretty surreal beating up some of the harmless NPCs from the first game here, but that also doesn't stop it from being really funny. But back on the topic of the world. You're railroaded pretty hard throughout the campaign, but you can eventually come across side quests that you can choose to take on or ignore. These will often reward you with weapons, health pickups, or even skill points to place into basic stat categories like health, stamina, and strength. Or you can pump points into leadership. The more points you put into this stat, the more you'll be able to recruit people along your journey. The big reward at the end of a side quest will often be allies. This big beaver guy, this random dude in the jail, and even Deidre will jump in and help you throw hands. But the stronger the ally, the more leadership points you'll have to have. As you can see by our in-game stats, we didn't bother. Having two human players with leveled up strength, stamina, and health was more than enough for us to get through. I didn't end up tackling this one on hard mode because I felt like Nick deserved somewhat of a break. I've been dragging him through unnecessarily tough Love games that. this entire year. And also, I feel like I've already seen the problems the camera system can bring in the first game. But yeah, you don't need allies if you have a friend. Exploring these areas to find treasure clams made sure we were constantly geared up for fights. And there were also the optional skill totems we found through careful use of our artifacts. Like this secret area that we found by linking a pig to this orb above a well. Or the secret room we found by lighting all the fires at the end of the world. Um, as far as music goes, I'm happy to report that it's much better than the first game. Patricio was cooking in the the kitchen on this one. Tracks feel far more diverse in their composition. I can actually hear distinctive melodies throughout. A lot of the tracks incorporate more electronic elements, which helps to highlight the otherworldly nature of Xenozoid. The Jail's theme is a good example of a track that's similar to the first game's droning bombastic noise, but it's better off due to the inclusion of a smaller digital melody that cuts through, giving it some uniqueness. <laughs> Returning to Halstom, the new town theme is way better at conveying the vibe of what goes on within the walls. And within that, you have individual themes like the Moth Collector. These small tunes help to highlight the residents of the city so well, but it's nothing I would be caught listening to while going down the road. Now, we've seen just about everything Xenoclash 2 has to offer, but there's one last thing to discover after the credits roll, but I thought it appropriate to leave it to the end of this section in the retrospective. Let's see.
Throughout the game, you can come across these little cubes. There are eight in total. And once you find them all, you can bring them to this door in the desert, which has some items in it, sure, but most interestingly, it has these stones. These stones tell the story of a civilization, presumably this one, in their pursuit to create their own chimeras. It was going well and most people accepted it. That is, until they started to breed with each other regardless of the species that were a part of. Then when they started to speak and gain intelligence, the laws could no longer distinguish who was a man or an animal. When this happened, the civilization exiled these creatures to a faraway land. They referred to these creatures as Xenos, but the creatures took it upon themselves to call their land Xenozoic. The civilization required more barriers, though. They had positioned themselves between great mountains, vast oceans, and unbearable deserts. But to guard these barriers from the Xenos, they created four golems. The last two tablets make clear that an undetermined amount of time has passed since the original generation of Xenos came to this land and which generation lost the ability to read and write has been lost to time as well. And the final quote, They created Xenozoic to forget about us. Did they know that we would also forget about them? Okay, so what we got from that is that the weird walking abominations that we have to punch in the face are in fact the results of interspecies mingling cast away by the original civilization. They had the ability to be civilized at one point, but have lost it over an unknown amount of time. And also, most interesting to me, this implies we're still on the first generation of golems. The four that this plaque names are the ones that we visit and fight throughout the game, meaning that Caxtay's hopes that there will be replacement golems sent if they all die is just that at this point, a hope. I think this is a pretty cool reward for those who go the extra mile to find the cubes. Or look up a guide on YouTube, shoutouts to this guy. Xenoclash 2 does everything a good sequel should do. It expands combat in a way that doesn't demolish what the original laid out, but instead builds upon it in exciting ways. While I wish there was more clarity for certain mechanics, I think it's an overall improvement. The means of refilling the special meter could be more clear, but it's a small price to pay for one of the better first-person melee action combat systems I've ever seen, with it allowing for crazier strings of attacks to be pulled off, and this is much needed from the original game's limited move pool. Visually, I'd say the series has found a nice new home in the Unreal Engine. The wide open environments can be absolutely gorgeous and still maintain the strange factor the series is known for. Narrative wise, I'm still conflicted. Gat wasn't an incredible protagonist in the first game, but here, he's insufferably hot headed at times. Remat is probably the most unremarkable character the game has to offer, but this isn't surprising. I truly believe one of the main reasons she was chosen to be the other face of the franchise is because of her design. It's immediately more eye-catching than a woman with curly hair and bug pinchers coming out of her head. I mean, why else would Remat be the sole character on the original soundtrack's cover if not because the team were that proud of her design? I like where the golem plot went, but I'm also left more confused as to what the future holds. I really do want to see what's next for this world, but less so for the people. I'm not incredibly attached to them, as I've explained. But the setting of a world that was isolated from another world because of their own mistakes is beyond interesting. I just hope we get to see some sort of satisfactory next chapter in the last current game in the series. After a decade-long hiatus, fans finally received confirmation that their long-dormant game franchise was returning. Revealed at the Naked Connect online press conference in July 2021, Clash Artifacts of Chaos was originally scheduled for release in June of 2022 but was unfortunately delayed a total of three times and was eventually set to release on March 9th of 2023. As I mentioned, the development team has evolved quite a bit since the beginning of our journey through Xenozoic. We're no longer three brothers making our dream project for the world to hopefully love, we're now a studio of around 19 employees working on one of the most ambitious projects they have ever tackled. Obviously inspired by the likes of From Software's Soul series, the team sought to expand the gameplay of the Xeno series even further, adding more role-playing elements and custom customization than ever before, as well as drastically increasing the size of the adventure. The first game could run you around three or four hours to complete, the second game ran us about six or seven hours, and the third game, Artifacts of Chaos, keeps the tradition alive and doubles that number, giving us a 13 to 14 hour adventure through Xenozoic. As I mentioned at the beginning, I've already played this game before, and I ended up enjoying my time so much that a couple of months later I thought it would be fun to cover the entire series. It helps that the games weren't all that long, but still, that carries a pretty big implication that this game is good enough to make someone want to check out what came before it. So let's finish this thing up with our last adventure through this insane world we've all come to know and love. On the side of a dirt road, this bully stops an old man and attempts to rob him. In this era of Xenozoic, the land has progressed somewhat and introduced a single law. 
This law is known as the ritual. It mandates that physical altercations will be preceded by this game of dice, where both participants will take turns playing checks to whittle down the other's dice count. The player with the highest dice count will then be able to use an artifact of chaos on the loser before they fight. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean much for Grandpa, as the bully accidentally kills the old man, leaving his young grandson all alone. But just then, a wandering hermit steps in to get payback for the old man. This is Sudo, a stoic but good-hearted martial artist. Sudo, seeing that the young boy is scared and alone, determines that the best place for him to go is Gemini's palace. Gemini being the most powerful person in Xenozoic and the creator of the ritual. Sudo planned on just waiting outside the gate until a messenger passed through, then asking the messenger to take the boy to the mountains. But when they arrive, Arrive, each of the gate's guardians lets them pass through without question. Turns out, Gemini is already on the lookout for the boy in hopes that he can help her. Now where did you see him? Careful. I, um, huh, I'm not sure anymore. I have a bad memory. Pseudo gets bad vibes from this little interaction and tells Gemini to piss off, with the multi-headed monster not taking kindly to that. <laughs> Now determined to keep this kid safe, Sudo makes it his mission to escort the boy to his brother in the mountains. On their way to the mountains, the duo passes through this small town, running into the traveling merchant Eo. This odd fellow is a traitor and one of Xenozoic's best sources of information. He tells of Gemini's prime artifact, the first ever created, the Artifact of Pain. If played against any ordinary artifact, it will override it, giving her the ability to strike first with her really big metal stick. This metal stick has killed many who attempt to oppose her, making her quite the reputation. But that's not all. Gemini created three more great artifacts, almost as powerful as hers, and gave them to her gatekeepers. Bad business, those three. Now, you will say, Eo, you could counter one of these great artifacts, could you not? Yes, if you could find a great shield artifact. But who could ever find four? Not Eo, and not you either, Eo thinks. Now Sudo and the boy are searching for the four great shield artifacts as well to break Gemini's iron vice grip over the land. After traveling through the mountains, we find the boy's older brother, but as soon as he sees the boy, he begins laying into him, yelling at him for letting their grandpa die. The boy has mentioned his curse to Sudo a few times at this point, but it's here that we learn he can link people together similar to someone else we know. At first, I thought it was a blessing. Grandfather had gotten weak, but when we were linked together, his old strength came back. We could go hunting together and keep our family fed and safe. But then one day, it all went wrong. Grandfather was bitten, and the curse the curse took my arm. Pseudo beats the brother up, calls him a pussy for crying about all this instead of doing something about it, and goes off to find the director. The director, who has a weird thing for destiny and fate, makes Pseudo drink poison before the fight, but he's beaten, much to the chagrin of Pseudo, who is now dying from said poison. But as somewhat of an apology, the brother agrees to be linked to Pseudo to save his life. And from here, the story is a lot of going to X location to see and or fight this person, then we learn what they know, maybe get one of the great shield artifacts along the way, but very little happens to progress any overarching narrative. Instead, we get a lot of character development for Pseudo. The initially cold and distant hermit starts to come out of his shell as he continues to spend time with the boy. There are several cute moments of them just interacting with each other and these do a good job of making us believe the transformation their relationship goes through. Pseudo, did you ever have a pet? I have you. <laughs> I'm not a pet. You sure? I feed you, I protect you, I carry you around. Sounds like a pet to me. You carry me around because you're my beast of burden. Like a donkey. Donkeys have scales. I said like a donkey. You never listen. You know who else never listens? Mm, let me guess. Donkeys? Exactly. They're wonderful at establishing the familial bond you get from these two. We will get more into this later, but I just had to highlight how much I like these two as protagonists. As the story progresses, the boy complains that he can hear this music, a song that he hears all the way across Xenozoic. It grows much louder when they make their way north and find this odd machine making the noise. This is also apparently where Pseudo grew up and where his master is from. But our yellow thumb thumb gets the heebie-jeebies from this thing and doesn't know where his master is, grabbing the little bird and leaving for the time being. After a time and retrieving a shield artifact from the core of the free, the boy starts complaining about the music being too much. So much so that it leaves him unconscious. Pseudo, without knowing what to do, runs all the way back to the north and destroys the machine. But before leaving, sees that his master has returned. No! 
The returning purple-headed man-thing does what he does best, gives us more questions than answers, and sends us on our way. Oh, and he also happened to have a great shield artifact. From there, the game continues pretty normally until the end credits. The boys return safely to Pseudo after beating up one of Gemini's gatekeepers. The last shield artifact is collected from a giant whale's stomach, and then Pseudo defeats the gatekeepers and Gemini, ridding Xenozoic of their rule. Afterwards, though, the two return to Pseudo's house to live out the rest of their days. That is until one night when Pseudo wakes up and sees that the boy is missing. He then treks all the way up to the highest point in all of Xenozoic to see that Caxte is about to leave on board an actual spaceship, which, interestingly enough, you can see and even walk on this thing in the previous game, but we had no idea what it was back then, so it was a pretty cool easter egg to see. But Caxte has taken the boy with the hope that his abilities will make things better. He says that the people he serves, which I have to assume is the civilization, will make things better. He actually pleads with Pseudo to see it logically. If the boy stays with him, eventually he will die, and then the boy will be alone again, all by himself to face the next Gemini or whatever that comes along wanting his power. If the boy goes with Caxte, there could be a chance for them to help Xenozoic and anywhere else that needs it. But Pseudo isn't having it, relentlessly assaulting Caxte with each blow wearing Pseudo down as well thanks to the Link ability. Xenozoic is sick, father. And so is the world that Caxte comes from. I don't think he understands it. But things die when they are not connected. Like you almost died. When you were all alone. Before you found me. I don't want to be alone again. But how will things change if there is no link between them and us? I can be that link. The boy is confident that he can bring change to Xenozoic and the surrounding worlds, but this will mean leaving with Caxte and possibly not seeing Pseudo ever again. The old hermit concedes, allowing the only thing he truly cares for to vanish into the night sky. The game closes out with Pseudo walking back through town with Gemini's prime artifact in hand, only to cast it into the smelter, abolishing Xenozoic's one and only law. You know, I was hoping that going through this game after playing the previous two would allow me to see things I didn't see before, winks and nods that are only visible to fans of Xenoclash. But as you can see, Clash Artifacts of Chaos has next to nothing to do with the previous two Clash games. There is no mention of Gat, Deidre, Remap, Father Mother, or even any golems. And though Caxte is here, the word golem is never mentioned. Speaking of Caxte though, his existence here raises a few questions. Firstly, he's alive. I'm surprised to see him after he, you know, was crushed in the previous game. Meaning that those replacements must have come, and I guess they were all literal replacements. We know that they're at least part machines, so so I wonder if he retained his previous knowledge. I would assume this is the case because he mentions how he's been waiting longer than Pseudo could imagine. Does this mean that the other three golems are somewhere in Xenozoic as well? Or is this so far into the future of the original games that Caxte is the only surviving golem? The boy having the Link power also had me raising an eyebrow. From what we know, Caxte was given the Link power by his creators. How does, I assume, an organic life have the same powers? Did he swallow a golem ring artifact? And why does Caxte even need the boy's link power? He obviously still has his link power if the boss fight is anything to go by. And another thing! Throughout the game, my headcanon was that the boy's grandfather was father mother. It was a long shot since he wasn't nearly as tall and he was missing the bomb injury on the left side of his face. But after completing the game and purchasing the digital art book, I learned that, yeah, this isn't father mother. They make sure to say that they're the same species but that's it. So my already weak theory kinda goes out the window. I kept trying to make connections like this throughout the playthrough. Was the outcast that Jim and I sent off because they were both too dangerous Gat? No, this guy only describes a few Corwoods from the previous game, and he makes no connections to the previous game and is honestly just too big. Is the Bounty Hunter Claw supposed to be a descendant of the Bounty Hunter from the first game? It's possible, but the art book says that they only took visual inspiration from the old Hunter's design, so that's probably a no. Is this corpse hugging this post supposed to be a reference to this Corwood in the second game who hugged the Burning Pyre until they died? Well, probably not, because the Corwood Corwood Woods is on the other side of the map. This is likely just smart asset reuse. The town is just called the town and could be the remnants of Halstom, but we'll never know for sure. The only definitive connective tissue that I came across throughout my journey was word. This giant whale has lived for a long time and gives Pseudo and the boy a history lesson after they help him out. He pretty much just tells the story of the civilization and the chimeras that the tombstones from two told, but with some new little nuggets of info. Notably, some humans were also cast out into Xenozoic, with this being how we 
ended up with straight humans like Gat and Reman. The only straight human characters left by this point in Xenozoic is this guy with a hammer, and the art book even confesses that he was added late in development when the team realized they didn't have any strictly human characters. But all of this nonsense is to say, I don't think there are any returning characters or even winks or nods for a reason. At times, this game feels like a reset for Xenozoic, a wipe of the place so that new games and stories aren't bogged down by what happened in the previous two. I wonder who built all this? Does it matter? They're all gone. I think it does. Now, as someone who feels somewhat attached to what happened in the previous games, this saddens me and I hope there is some sort of plan to bridge the two timelines. I would love to see some fan service in the future that's not a DLC armor set that kinda looks like Metamock. But also, on the other hand, I love this new era of Xenozoic. Firstly, everyone is just less stupid. And while it doesn't come through for everyone, especially since the first thing we see is someone accidentally beating someone to death, you can tell that the citizens of Xenozoic have been somewhat tamed. Instead of immediately beating everyone up, the one law has caused most people to become more articulate, actually stopping and playing the ritual before the slobber knocker begins. Jonas Kiratze, best known for his writing in the Talos Principle as well as its upcoming sequel, was brought on to help pin the story here. And it shows in the quality of the dialogue. Not to say that the previous games had bad dialogue, but the jumping quality is massive. The characters feel like characters and have small quirks that add a lot to this world other than it being zany. Big praise has to go to the new voice direction as well. Most of the voices in the previous games weren't amazing, let's be honest. And then he killed himself. Earlier in the video I said that it added to the charm of Xenozoic being a weird place, but yeah, you know, now that we actually have good actors, we can just keep this forever. But you know what? Edmundo still kills it as Caxte. He's been voicing him since the first game and the stilted delivery still fits perfectly even with the new look. The big standout though is obviously Glenn Rage as Pseudo. He was an absolutely inspired choice for this weathered old badass. He sells the exhaustion when he needs to, he's sassy and genuinely funny when he needs to be. Uh, fellas, let's just fight. This is boring, and I get very cranky when I'm bored. And he can also sell the tear-jerking moments. I genuinely can't believe I haven't heard this guy in more stuff. Like, what else has he actually been in? I'm curious now. Oh man, he's been in a lot of stuff. He's also been around for a while. Let's see. Oh, no way. He's the beetle from It Takes Two? No way, hold up. I'm a vegetarian and gluten-free. I get paid nectar. Huh, I'll be damned. That's pseudo. It is strange that the residents of this isolated land away from any other civilization have different accents all of a sudden. Most have variations on the Queen's English and some have no discernible accent, but it doesn't feel like there's a rhyme or a reason to those who do and don't. It's distracting that these real world accents developed out of thin air, even given the presumed time skip from Xenoclash 2 to Artifacts of Chaos. Xenozoic isn't without its eclectic characters though, don't get the wrong idea. Take Gemini, this lady has several heads fused together, but they're slowly dying. Each of them had a separate personality and the art book tells that the ones that don't speak are already dead. She wanted the boy's power to save her own life, giving her a sympathetic side. The Corwood of the Free are still around, but they get significantly less screen time overall. I guess their introduction in the first game really did do the Corwood the most justice. I think we only talked to two Corwood while we're there. The first one is this guy who's ripping the heads off of pigeons because he wants to make them blood. I make the pigeon blood. <laughs> and the other holds the Great Shield artifact. He claims to be more free than the other Korrid because he is slightly intelligent, and what this amounts to is him eating the dice during the ritual. It's probably one of my favorite moments in the game for how memorable it is. It's like when Ellie gets attacked at the workbench in The Last of Us Part 2. It's so unexpected. But every other Korrid is merely a wacky face to punch. And the director is pretty boring as far as they go too. He doesn't do anything but spout off some generic stuff about destiny and fate before getting beat up by Pseudo. And speaking of the main man, he's a protector at heart. When he finds the boy at the beginning of the game, he's truly aimless and mostly shut off from the world around him. Only after traveling with the boy do we see him open up. So after winning a previously failed fight, the boy will quickly thank Pseudo with him replying. In the early game, Pseudo only grunts or gives a one-worded response. You saved me. What did you think I would do? But as you continue to play and rescue the boy more and more, Pseudo's responses become more reassuring. Thank you, Pseudo. I'll always come back for you, little bird with him even slipping up in the first conversation with Caxte, almost calling him his boy. And then, after the undetermined amount of time in the epilogue, Pseudo is straight up calling the boy his son. This transition didn't seem as smooth in my first playthrough, but I can see it's very genuine after a second. It's not even a contest for me. Pseudo is the best protagonist the Xenoclash franchise has ever seen. I care about this lonely old man and the journey he went on only for it to end right back where he started. I can't wait to see what happens to Pseudo the next time we see him. But now we have to talk about the other 
reason why this is the best game in the franchise. The fresh new take on the series staple martial arts combat. We've moved past the first-person perspective of the original games and are now in full-on third-person action game territory. Like I mentioned, we've taken some heavy inspiration from the Souls games as far as structure goes, but the God of War reboot also had a major influence on this game. If you couldn't see the influence through the way Pseudo and the boys' relationship grows like Kratos' and Atreus's, then look no further than combat. Pseudo is forever looking in the direction that the camera is facing. I do have my issues with this type of camera system, but this undoubtedly makes the battlefield the most clear it's ever been, which in turn makes the combat the best it's ever been. And we'll dive into the nitty gritty momentarily, but much like real fights in Artifacts of Chaos, we have to get familiar with the ritual. Before throwing hands, intelligent enemies will ask that you obey the one law. If you accept, your enemy will select an Artifact of Chaos with you doing so as well. After each player's total has been tallied, you take turns playing checks to diminish the other's total. These checks can do things like reduce each dice in a small area by one, flip one of your own dice onto its opposite side, or even throw a crab with six dots on its back on the field to add to your total, but after everyone's checks have been played, the game is over and whoever has the biggest total gets to play their Artifact of Chaos on the opponent. These can have several different consequences. Some are pretty standard like the winner having a free lick with a f***ing 2x4, or maybe they get tied down to a specific point in the arena, having their movement severely neutered. But there are also more supernatural artifacts. The Fog Artifact lays a haze over the entire arena, making the enemy forces attack wildly and hit each other. You can call a swarm of bugs to do damage to the enemies if they stand still, or you you can call a dinosaur bird thing to fight by your side until the end of the fight when you have to beat it to actually end the fight. But my favorite is the Pact Artifact. If you play this on an enemy and win, they are locked to that artifact. And if you use the same artifact in another battle, your previous opponent is summoned as an ally. Kinda like an evolution of the ally system from Xenoclash 2 now that I think about it. I was lucky enough to beat Claw in this playthrough with a Pact and then I got to call him to fight a bunch of people with me. But even funnier was me beating the deserter with a Pact and then going to Jim I early so I could use the pact on her, making him return to the place he was banished from. <laughs> uh, I'm so lame. The ritual is cool. I like the idea of using all these different status effects on enemies to make the fights easier on yourself. And early on, the ritual is quick and easy, getting us into the slugfest without it being a drag. But seeing as how this is an RPG, you have to feel that progression. This translates into buying more and more dice as you play, and buying extra slots on your belts for more checks. By endgame, both players are playing 5 or 6 checks and throwing out 2 to 3 cups full of dice for every match. It becomes exhausting, especially when I know I'm overleveled as shit and will inevitably knock these guys out in a shorter amount of time than the ritual took to play. God forbid I spend all this time strategizing and playing my checks as well as possible only for it to end in a tie and no one play an artifact. That's why I just cut my losses and started attacking enemies outright, skipping the ritual entirely and any benefits it could bring. There is an option to let the boy play the ritual for you, and I thought that would have been a skip button, letting Chance play the game so you get straight into the fight if you don't want to sit through it. But nope, you still have to sit there and watch the game play dice with itself. What a missed opportunity. The ritual is a cool idea, but it could stand to have a lot more fat trim. But okay, okay, the one law isn't why you're playing this game. The combat itself is why. On the X button, we have Pseudo's main attack. With this, he can execute a string of attacks, and by holding it, he can execute a heavy attack. The Y button is where our special attacks are. Three of these moves can be mapped to Y plus forward, Y plus backwards, and Y while stationary. A jump on A can flow into a jumping attack. B will dodge Pseudo in a direction, as well as allowing him to perform dodge attacks in any of the four directions. And finally, the left bumper will parry attacks. Those are the basics, but now let's get into what makes this combat system so special. In a pre-release video, Carlos runs through the open area showing off a few of the game's mechanics. He explains how much they've taken from fighting game fundamentals with the hopes of implementing these into an action Souls-like. And most interestingly of these fighting game mechanics is cancelling. During a standard combo, if timed right on the moment where a hit connects, Pseudo can cancel his actions directly into other actions. Any light attacks can be cancelled into any dodge attacks or jump attacks. As long as you're using light, dodging, and jumping, you can chain moves indefinitely. You can even cancel into a parry if you can get the timing down, which makes the stiff parry far more useful. Heavy attacks and special moves can't be cancelled out of though, so those moves should always be combo enders. And the timing of your moves entirely depends on what stance you have equipped. Throughout the adventure, Pseudo can find these statues, and when interacted with, they put him in a one-on-one -on -one fight. After winning this fight, he'll either gain a new special move or a new stance. Stances are wholesale new move sets for Pseudo. It's actually pretty impressive how varied the stances are. Each have their own standard combo, unique 
forward, back, and sideways dodge attacks, heavies, and a jump attack. Some combos have more difficult rhythms to internalize, so choosing a stance that you can read makes a huge difference on whether or not you can successfully master canceling. I started out with the slash stance, which focuses on these wide-reaching claw swipes. It was okay for a time, but it started to get a little unruly when I used the side dodge. It would make Sudo move to the side too much, interrupting my flow. The back dodge attack sees Sudo rolling into an attack which is actually pretty useful for going under some attacks. But if the attacks don't flow into each other well enough, like that side dodge attack, I'm not loving it. I then moved on to the lightning stance, and I really enjoyed it for a time. The strikes came out really quick, giving me plenty of opportunities to move in and out of other attacks. But the attacks themselves weren't as strong as I would have liked. But then I found a new love in the boxing stance. The strikes aren't too slow, and they really pack a punch. And this roundhouse kick that Sudo does at the end of the combo is amazing and flows incredibly well into other attacks. So well, in fact, that I can do this. But I still fell back on my old love, the shadow stance. The hits are just as fast as the lightning stance, but they end in this explosion that gives it compromise between range and power that no other stance has. And the dodge attacks are incredible. This is kind of hard to explain without feeling the moves for yourself, but they're all animated so well that feeling out the timing to cancel them into other moves is effortless. The look, the feel, the utility, Shadow Stance has it all to me. Then we have the special moves. I was pretty stubborn on this playthrough. I had my favorites and I stuck with them. I got my hands on the only special totem I apparently missed in my first playthrough and found my new favorite combo ender. This sure you can ass uppercut. Similar to Shadow Stance, it checks all of my boxes for what a good move is, leading me to pulling off some really cool combos. Then there's the multi-strike. Sudo will lunge a great distance forward and throw out three quick barrages of punches. This isn't a great combo ender because of its lengthy startup, but as a means of launching myself at an enemy, it's awesome. It can be a little awkward when the enemy slowly backs away just barely out of the range of the punches, but it's still a great move. And then the projectile. The only projectile in the game, seeing as how guns are apparently no longer around in Xenozoid. But similar to the guns with unlimited ammo from the first game, the projectile is a godsend. It does is exactly what it sounds like it would do. Sudo will throw a projectile at an opponent, leading to the most abusable move in the game. If an enemy isn't aware of your presence, you can stay at a distance and simply whittle down their health until they keel over. I did this a lot in my previous playthrough, and I have to assume that other people did too, because on this run, enemies are likely to parry the projectiles when they pass a certain health threshold. Well, maybe parry is giving it too much credit because they could just have their back completely turned, but it makes the parry sound when the move connects. So it's more like they just shrug off the damage. Those were the three that I stuck with for my playthrough, but there are plenty of other special moves in the game. Like the teleport, it can be so cool for giving enemies the runaround. And I could easily see myself pulling off some fun stuff with the clone punch. But these moves are all about building Sudo's moveset to your liking. And this is easily, without question, the game's best feature. When you're at endgame and you have your favorite moves maxed out and you know the animations like the back of your hand, it can be exhilarating. But notice how I said when you're at endgame, Clash's combat system is not perfect. And the one thing that I was immediately reminded of is how fragile Sudo is when you start off. There's this guard meter underneath the health bar and it depletes when you strike enemies. The game claims that when this bar is full, Sudo will automatically block attacks and take half damage. I never saw any tangible benefit from this mechanic, so it can't help but feel half-baked. But the other problem is how fast that meter drains when you're sliding through the battlefield canceling and throwing combos out, all of which drain this already small meter. I guess the game wants you to unleash a small onslaught and then recover and go on the defensive, but why would I do that? I already don't see the benefits of the guard meter, so I'm going to do what I do see working, dodging and parrying their attacks rather than tanking them? I don't get it. Then there's Sudo's special meter. This thing fills up after dealing damage and it feels even faster when perfectly parrying and canceling moves. But once it's filled up, Sudo will sock one enemy, transitioning the camera to a first person perspective. The obvious callback is to the previous Clash games, but I don't love this. 
Pseudo can still do all the things he can normally do, light attacks, a heavy attack, even parry and cancel actions into each other, but this first person mode feels janky. Trying to chain attacks into each other is a crapshoot. If you try to, say, cancel into something from your final hit, the enemy is knocked backwards. This is a problem because Pseudo doesn't really track the enemy while in first person. I whiffed so many heavy attacks because of that sh**. Canceling light attacks into other dodge attacks was slightly better, but still sometimes ended in me not hitting anything. And I would even see the standard combo whiffing on enemies that were just right in front of me sometimes. Unless I'm feeling rambunctious, I always just hammered the attack button in this state. It's the most reliable because the finishing hit would stun enemies long enough for me to waltz pseudo over to them to repeat the process. But it's really difficult to work for it and then activate it, only to immediately get taken out of it by a move that's difficult to counter thanks to my now limited movement and visibility. And it also sucks to be laying on the- Oh, yep, see, there we go. Sometimes you just get kicked out of it, burning my meter for no reason. Ugh. And when you deal enough damage, you get these cinematic finishers. I absolutely love these things. Almost every enemy type has a unique finisher that does a lot of damage if it doesn't outright finish the fight. The animation team on this game should be really proud of the work they've done. These finishers are so cool, and Pseudo looks like he causes some real blunt force trauma with these. The first person stuff is neat for the reference and the style finishers bring, but it needed some more time in the oven if you ask me. I'm not against its inclusion, I just need it to actually be useful. And this is if the enemies even allow you to get past their defenses in the first place. The enemies in this game have an awful habit of throwing out attacks so quickly that you have no way of reacting to it. It doesn't happen too often, and the grab moves that I complained about in my first playthrough seem to have been toned down, but I can't stand putting so much effort into a boss fight only to be swatted away like a fly when they're done with me. And I was also pissy when this big guy killed me by getting up off the ground! On the whole, enemies are good. They all have attacks that are pretty fair and I was able to react accordingly. I was even able to catch a few thrown rocks and send them back, which always feels good. There was no enemy that I found to be too challenging. No, not even the extra encounters you can find after dark. So yeah, at nighttime or after dying during the day, Pseudo's avatar will wake up. And even after playing the game twice, I have no idea what this is. Pseudo never comments on the fact that he becomes a wooden doll at nighttime. The boy has one line about how he he sees Pseudo in his dreams, but that tells me nothing about what's really going on here. You start the game as the Avatar and are surrounded by copies of it, but again, what does it mean? During the day, Pseudo won't be able to cross these thorny bushes, but at a campsite, you can wake up during the night to wander around previously explored areas and move through these bushes. They're often linear, one-way detours that can lead to a few different things. A tough enemy to beat that will see the bushes cleared away for daytime Pseudo, traditional shortcuts like a locked door, again, now available during the day, a hidden chest with powerful upgrade materials or a body part for the avatar. These body parts are separated into sets and you'll be able to find the head, torso, arms, and legs strung up in these dream catchers. Each of them grants additional points to be added to the player's total at that point. The one I always stuck with was the bone skin, aside from the head. I didn't find it in this playthrough, don't know why. But the increase in power these things gave me made the optional nightmare battles pushovers. After besting some of the encounters from the campaign, nightmare variants of certain enemies will start popping up in certain places at night. All of the shield artifact holders like the director, you can find a nightmare version of grandpa complete with that pathetic cane attack, a nightmare claw can be challenge, which was one of the tougher fights, honestly. And then, after all of them have been beaten, a nightmare version of Gemini will appear in the town. But even it wasn't a match for me, and it wasn't entirely because I was overleveled at that point. That was part of it, but it wasn't all of it. No, it's because of how uninvolved fights really are. One thing about combat that never feels quite right is how little strategy it requires. Like, you can read attack animations to determine what attacks to watch out for and which you can punish, or you can be defensive, using the parry to safely build up your super meter if that's what you want to do. But all that stuff isn't nearly as effective as laying a honey-thick layer of smackdown on your opponent so decadent that they can't breathe. To a certain extent, this combat system feels button mashy. You still do have to know what you're doing, and dodging out of the way of enemy attacks does keep you out of harm's way, but it also waters down every encounter. Every enemy, from the little peons to Nightmare Gemini, are beaten with the same exact strategy. Every. Single. Time. 
While some might have more devastating moves that they can use to swipe behind them and take a chunk out of your health, they all eventually succumb to you staying to their back and just laying into them. This is at its worst when fighting the gigantic enemies. These behemoths have devastating attacks, but it doesn't matter if you stay behind them. And yeah, you can't tell what's going on because the camera is too busy inspecting their prolapse, but if you can continue to dodge, cancel, and lay on the damage, they will fall. Either that, or you can rely on our good friend, Mr. Projectile. This is also why I don't feel the need to go deeply into any particular boss or enemy type. They all do have their own unique attacks, but they don't make a difference. I fight every single enemy in the game the same exact way. Again, I will reiterate that it can be immensely fun to successfully chain these moves into each other, even if it does become a little mindless. But if you need something more reactive, you might want to look elsewhere. But if looks and sound are what you need to enjoy a game, I mean, look no further. The soundtrack for this game is the best of the bunch by far. Patricio is once again back for this soundtrack, and he just keeps getting better. Some of the tracks do still fall into the more atmospheric category, and they kind of lose me, but even those tracks stand out more than ever. But then you have the absolute banger. Pseudo's theme gets you pumped, but Pseudo Returns cranks that up to the next level and it's probably my favorite of the bunch. The town theme is different from any town theme we've heard in this series. It's really downtrodden, almost sad I would say. Unstoppable sounds like the first phase of a final boss in an RPG and I love it. And the Traitor's theme is the weirdest track on the OST, but I'll be damned if it doesn't fit EO like a glove. The pieces that are here are way more interesting than anything else we've heard before. After my first playthrough, I went and bought the soundtrack for myself and I haven't looked back. It's a great listen, even if a few tracks are a tad more atmospheric than I would like. And visually, the game looks absolutely stunning. Using the next iteration of the Unreal Engine, Unreal 4, the team has developed one of the most unique visual styles I've ever seen in a game. Honest to God, between this and Ghost of Tsushima, this is exactly what happens whenever a team has a strong vision for artistic style and powerful tech. This kind of thing just doesn't happen unless you have extremely talented people in every corner of the team. I thought it looked amazing at the beginning of the year, and it looks amazing now, with the color choices being some of the most vivid we've seen in this series to date. And oh my god, when the boy is in danger and there's a path from the town all the way to the North Temple, it's, oh, it's breathtaking. Everywhere that's not the direct path is stripped of all color, and I just don't think I'll ever get over this sequence. Not to mention the texture work. So this game features animated textures. This will give these pencil lines in the buildings or creatures a jumpy look, like these sketches are moving almost. It's most prominent when looking at the boy, where his feathers will twitch and flicker. It makes everything so alive and abstract. While we don't see anything as abstract, abstract as the trees and animals from Xenoclash 2's opening area, this game still has some bizarre looking stuff. The opening area has some environments that look kinda similar, and these mountain lions with bearded old man faces are striking. But I think Xenozoic has been dialed back. None of the architecture is as Tim Burton as before. Buildings are more practical, even if the town doesn't look as populated as Halstom. The Corwood Woods are mostly just tree houses and swamps. The northern temples, or what's left of it, are no longer bathed in darkness and sand, they're run down and borderline futuristic. The mountains are just mountains, no crazy pink tower light bridges in sight. You can also see it when you're atop the mountains and look out over Xenozoic. The regions are distinct and discernible, but not as cartoony or exaggerated as something from the previous games. In a way, this could be seen as a step back in art style, but I see it more as a refinement. The first and second game's worlds fit their stories more. The narrative was strange and macabre, so the setting and the characters need to reflect that. We had a bunch of dumb people who knew nothing but filth and fighting, essentially being tech to these guardians who were instructed to keep them in their playpen. That just sounds stupid. But in this game, as played out as it is, we have a man thrust into a caretaker role. He gets attached to this boy, then gets separated from him. A more grounded and relatable story calls for a more grounded and relatable setting. I'm not saying one is better than the other, and I definitely don't want them to leave the other story completely behind, but we're seeing this series mature before our very eyes. This art style might not be as wild, but I would argue it's more refined. It feels focused. Cax 
Max Tay, the scary, threatening golem, looked kind of dumpy in the first two games, but now he's been hitting the f***ing gym. This guy looks like he's going to do what he's going to do, and you can't stop him. I might be reading too much into this, but I also might not be. This might be a reset for Xenozoic, or it might be the start of something completely new. Maybe we'll get another game that follows up on the events of this game, as well as something that gives us closure on Gat's story. Until then, this is where the Xenoclash series ends, and man... Has it been one hell of a ride? Never have I played through a series of games with such a unique brand of everything. If there's one thing you can't take from the Xenoclash series, it's that it draws you into its setting. Andreas, Carlos, and Edmundo created a setting that is timeless. From Halstom's residence to the Corbett of the Free, all these places and people make for an absolutely unforgettable experience. And man, does that go for the gameplay too. When the original game came out in 2009, the market was at the height of its first-person shooter oversaturation. Call of Duty was seeing the height of its success with Modern Warfare 2 being released, and the Halo franchise was releasing its unconventional follow-up Halo 3 ODST. On top of that, you had over-the-top action games like Resident Evil 5 releasing. There was a style at the time for sure, and then there's this indie game using the first-person perspective to make you do hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah, it was clunky, but it was unorthodox, which people took note of. Xenoclash 2 sought to refine the combat mechanics, and in my opinion, it did so. While it still wasn't quite there on the entire experience, I would absolutely call it an improvement. And as we progress from Xenoclash 1 and 2, we definitely lost something by way of truly unique gameplay. I don't think I ever have, and I may never again play a game quite like them. And that is something worth celebrating. Personally, and I am biased, I think a logical progression for the old style of Clash would be VR. I couldn't think of a better way to get immersed in Xenozoic than to walk around these locations in a simulated space, and hand-to-hand -hand combat is unbelievably rewarding in VR if done correctly. If Ace decides to return to that formula, my monkey paw wish would be that that's the way they do it. But what we did lose in truly unique gameplay from the old titles, we gain in accessibility and polish. Artifacts of Chaos from head to toe is a better game in every way than its predecessors. The combat is still challenging and focuses on martial arts, Arts, but from a far more intuitive perspective. The multiple stances and specials give players a lot of freedom to craft a fighting game character and then use said character in a Souls-like. It's a match made in heaven when it works, and only fumbles the ball when looking at the granular aspects of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. It's no wonder I had no problem actually getting the 100% completion this time around. The game is just that much fun. Is this the end of the Clash series? Almost certainly not. Artifacts of Chaos sold considerably well and is Ace Team's highest rated game on Steam. If I I was a betting boy, the new formula will be sticking around. But when that next game shows up, no matter the style, no matter the era, I'll be up for another adventure through Xenozoic. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end on this one, it means the world to me. I can imagine regulars of my channel are a bit shocked to see a series retrospective out of nowhere. I usually advertise them and hype them up as I'm working on them throughout a long stretch of time. Well, like I said, I was wanting to do something like this since I played Artifacts of Chaos earlier this year. And after the On Guard video, I was planning on playing two VR games back to back to coincide with Bone Lab's anniversary. But then, the morning I went to record the first game, Hubris, one of my motion tracking cameras had a mechanical error. So that threw a wrench in things. I made the necessary arrangements to have it sent off that day and I have it back, but I got immediately to work on this project. By the end of that day, I had the first Xenoclash beaten and had started the script. I'm trying to make the most of this year on this channel. We're almost at 10,000 subscribers, which is, it's honestly insane, guys. And I seriously can't thank you all enough. Even if you're not subscribed, I still thank you endlessly for just watching this video. And speaking of people I need to thank, you might have noticed the gorgeous thumbnail for this video. I have been wanting to work with my good buddy Sickross D4 for a while now. And as soon as I realized I was going full force on another retrospective, I knew it was the right time. Tyrone, if you happen to be watching, I can't thank Thank you enough, dude. You did such an incredible job, and I can't wait to work with you again in the future. Everybody, show him some love on his social medias. You can find all the links in the description. As for what's next for me, I uh, I really don't know. I uh, I got my VR camera back, so uh, I really want to do that Bone Lab anniversary video because the one year anniversary for Bone Lab's coming up. Like I said at the end of the Unguard video, um, I would love to do a video on Baldur's Gate 3. Me and Nick just finished our first playthrough, and we're actually running through it a second time, which never happens, but that video is a little intimidating, not gonna lie. That game is humongous, and I don't know if I could do it justice, but I'll try. I will try. Um, but if I'm being honest, the next video will probably be Sonic Frontier's Final Horizon update. 
the stuff that they, like, Frontiers was already a really good game. I loved that game. It got some flack for, from everybody else, but I loved Frontiers. But now, there's all this extra stuff they're adding. It looks like it's going to be even better, and we get a playable Knuckles in that combat system. Are you kidding me? It looks amazing. I, and a better final boss fight. Oh, my God. Th that'll probably be what ends up coming next, but anyway. I appreciate you so much for watching to the end of this video, so thanks for stopping by, and have a great day.